Welcome to this inaugural biology video. We are going to be looking at DNA profiling and we're going to be doing two videos, part one and part two. Before we start these videos or before you start to watch them, what I recommend you do is you go to the work area, the student shared area, go to the biology drive and download this PowerPoint printed out, printed out three slides per page and make your own notes as we go through the video. When you need to, pause the video and then you will be able to just make your own notes as we go through and go through at your own pace as well. There may be stuff you didn't pick up first time or just rewind the video, listen to it again. Really make sure that you've got a very, very clear, as clear as you can, an understanding of what's going on. We're looking at DNA profiling. You may uh, know it as DNA fingerprinting. Uh, it's the same process in essence. And it's a technique that was first invented, I suppose, uh, by Sir Alec Jeffries at the University of Leicester back in 1984. Now it's come on leaps and bounds since then, but in essence, that is, we still use today, the process that he came up with first of all. How do we use it? Well, you'll be familiar with its uses and kind of CSI type investigations. You, you want to find the killer, you want to match a sample of body fluid to a sample matched to the crime and you want to match that to a particular person. Also, of course, in paternity testing, just in case you're not sure the kid is really yours, all the chat show programs when they do DNA profiling on them. In this first part, we're going to look at how the genes are arranged on the chromosomes. Uh, and in the second part, we're going to see how we can use this arrangement for DNA profiling. Well, let's kick off. Let's say you've got your sample to start off with. You're a copper and you've got to the crime scene and there's the blood stain on that t-shirt there. Well, you can get DNA from that. How do you get it? Well, first of all, red blood cells, of course, are no use to you at all. It must be from a white blood cell, a leukocyte, uh, because red blood cells do not have a nucleus and they do not have mitochondria. So you can neither profile the mitochondrial DNA nor the chromosomal DNA. How do we get the DNA out of those white blood cells? Well, first of all, we remove the membranes, which are made out of phospholipids uh, primarily, and we remove that with detergents, which will emulsify those phospholipids. Then you will remember that our chromosomal DNA is associated with histone proteins. We need to get rid of those histone proteins, and we do that just with a simple protease. In fact, if you're doing this sort of isolation on pineapple DNA, Pineapple cells contain a whole load of protease locked away within lysosomes, and those proteases can just be used to digest uh, the histones in situ. Then we precipitate the DNA out uh, using really cold alcohols. You can use a phenol as well. That will precipitate the DNA out, DNA out into the uh, interface layer between the alcohol and the water in which uh, you end up dissolving it. This is a process you will have done if you have done the genes in the bottle experiment, which is great fun. And so we have our DNA sample. Well, so what? This is where we get into how our chromosomes are organized. On the screen here, we have the male karyotype. Karyotype means the chromosomes possessed in a particular genotype. And of course, in the male karyotype, you have chromosomes 1 up to 22, and then an X and a Y. Note, chromosomes 1 to 22 are all paired up. Uh, we are diploid individuals. This is a diploid karyotype here. Well, let's choose one of these, and let's have a look at chromosome number 9. You can see here's a list. Wow, a great big list of all these many, many genes on there. And you know what? There are so many more genes that are not listed here as well. So you can see there are hundreds of genes on each chromosome. Well, other than the Y chromosome, which has considerably fewer chromosomes. But also, there are gaps between our genes on our chromosomes. So, we're taking uh, chromosome number 9 again. Okay, you've got genes uh, which will determine ovarian cancer, albinism, interferon, deficiency, uh, that sort of thing. But there will be gaps between them. Now, slightly ignore these colored banding patterns on here. They are due to 
uh, other things. But there are great big gaps between our actual structural genes. Now, a structural gene as a definition is a gene which directly codes for a protein. And those structural genes have gaps between them. What occurs in those gaps? Well, for example, there might be genes which act as regulators. There are regulatory genes. There may be promoter sequences and other such things which control when you express the genes you do express. So there are some useful functions of these gaps, extremely useful functions. Indeed, if you change these regulatory genes, you can have a big effect on selection pressures. But there are also, in those gaps, great big regions of DNA which doesn't seem to do much. Well, it seems to have no obvious function. It used to be called junk DNA. That term has fallen out of favor now because more and more we realize the uh, importance of these stretches. But some clearly do not have a function. For example, they might be ancient retroviral sequences whereby a retrovirus has inserted its DNA into a chromosome of an ancestor many millions of years ago. And that has just been passed on from generation to generation, sitting there, doing nothing, just being a bit of a freeloader uh, and being copied uh, by your ancestors. Those are the gaps between our genes, but there are also gaps within our structural genes. These are called introns. Here is something we're going to be looking at in much greater detail uh, later on this term, but we have in our actual structural genes exons and introns. It is the exons which code for the protein. The introns, well, what happens to them? When they're copied, when you make an RNA copy of the DNA, those introns are copied with it. That is in a process called transcription. And that is a bell. After transcription, though, that RNA is not complete. What happens then is there is a spliceosome, a word you don't need to know, but it's a, a complex of RNA and protein, which splices out the introns. Those introns are removed, are digested, and are recycled. The RNA nucleotides are recycled. Then we have mRNA ready to be translated, and that mRNA is now allowed to leave the nucleus, and then it codes for an amino acid chain. The ribosome reads it, makes an amino acid chain, and that leads to the protein. Again, we used to think those introns had no useful value at all, and that this splicing process seems just like a great big waste of time and effort. But we are again beginning to realize function to it. Number one, it gives genetic, or well, the possibility of genetic variety, because what you can do is alternative splicing. So you may mix and match different exons together, or maybe you will extend the exon at one bit into an intron. Of course, if you do this, you'll give different proteins, and that can be very useful if you're making, for example, antibodies, and you want a large variety of antibodies available. So. We have gaps between our genes, we have gaps in our genes. Now, going back to those gaps between our genes, the ones between them, not within them, those gaps differ from person to person. We have these structures called short tandem repeats, or STRs, short tandem repeats. And this is an example of it here. This is a core sequence, C, 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 G, G, T, T, A. Now, that core sequence sometimes is merely repeated, and you get this tandem repeat here. And so you might get, for example, in one person, a fragment containing four tandem repeats, another person, a fragment containing six tandem repeats. There is no selection pressure on, these num on the number of tandem repeats. That is because they're between genes. They have no biological function that we can see maybe other than to mop up mutations. Therefore, natural selection doesn't weed them out. Therefore, mutations which occur to them aren't weeded out. And therefore, the number of STRs, short tandem repeats, vary between people without selection. How many STRs do you have? This is, of course, determined by your parents. And uh, let's say this is mummy here and this is daddy here well let's remind ourselves of how you get your chromosomes we'll look at again at chromosome number nine 
So you will get one chromosome number nine from your mother, one chromosome number nine from your father, and they will give you your diploid karyotype. Which chromosomes you inherit from your mother or your father is random. It could well have been the other chromosome number nine you inherit from your mother or from your father. Now, the chromosome number nine you inherit from your mother will, of course, have the same number of short tandem repeats, the STRs, that your mother had. And so you inherit your number of STRs from your parents. Now, it's unlikely there's going to be a mutation between uh, your parents and you, so you inherit it reliably. But the further back you go in time, and therefore in generations, the likelier it is that these mutations have occurred, changing, therefore, the number of STRs well, between different people. And people to whom you are unrelated will have different STRs to you. And at this point, we're going to pause because this is the end of part one.